Minnesotans will soon vote yes or no on two ballot questions. We detail both constitutional amendments in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in this week. I'm Julie Bartke with Capitol Report. Voter photo ID and defining marriage as a union between one man and one woman. These are the two issues that could be placed on the state's constitution pending the outcome of the November election. We sat down with the proponents and opponents of each of those ballot initiatives a few months ago, and we want to take this opportunity to air those segments again. And we begin with the constitutional amendment that would define marriage as a union between one man and one woman. A lot of people don't know why we're here. Why, why do we have this question before the public? And I think that's important to realize. Um, a few years ago, there was a couple who wanted to be married in Hennepin County. They were a gay couple. And they were denied due to the Minnesota state law, uh, recognizing marriages only between one man and one woman. They immediately challenged the rule that case is before the appellate court in the state of Minnesota. A number of other states have gone through this very same dance and the courts have ended up defining marriage. And that's really not the role of the courts. They should be not writing law, they should be only interpreting law. And as a result, we thought in the legislature that it's time now that the public should be involved in defining marriage uh, with their value system, not relying on a small group of politicians down in St. Paul, or even a smaller group of individuals, the judges, defining marriage from the bench. That's why the bill is now before the people of Minnesota this coming November. Why do you think voters should vote yes on this amendment? Well, first it defines marriage as one man, one woman. It's the traditional definition that's lasted the test of time for thousands of years. Uh, gay relationships, especially pushing into the marriage definition, is something that's more of a contemporary issue. Uh, every time other societies have gone down the role of recognizing gay homosexual relationships, it seems like that society doesn't last long. Uh, that's a historical fact. But at the same time, when we look at the reason why anyone gets married, certainly you have the love interest, you have the relational bond, but it's also for propagation of, of the population. It brings order to that, and uh, I believe that every, every scientific study has shown that the best relationship for a child to be raised in is one that you have the balanced parental relationship between a father and a mother, and that's the ideal. Senator, this bill has been described, or this amendment has really been described by many as the anti-gay amendment. Do you think this is an unfair description? Well, I think that's a harsh, a harsh description. Um, we don't uh, wish to have any negative uh, connotation given to it. I believe it's a fairly written bill. It's simply the question before the public is, shall Minnesota's Constitution be amended to recognize marriage as solely between one man and one woman? Yes or no? And it's an opportunity for the public now to get engaged, have their year-long discussion. We kind of described it as let's have a conversation. Let's, have, let's talk about this and let the public give the legislature a direction on how we should decide this. And I think now is the time to do that. You spoke a little bit earlier about the fact that same-sex marriage is currently illegal in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And you've also spoken about the intentions of this constitutional amendment. Did you think when you attached your name to it that would it would be such a divisive issue as well? Well, yeah, it's divisive wherever it goes. 31 states have considered it on their ballots. 31 states have passed it. Uh, I think it is important to have the public discussion. It's important to have the public involved. There's very few issues I would not give to the public uh, in consideration, but due to time and the consideration of cost, we limit it to just very important issues that come up from time to time. But um, yeah, we knew it was probably going to be uh, controversial. Uh, it raises a lot of emotional 
uh, ire on both sides, and yet we shouldn't be afraid of, of uh, you know, controversy. We should be able to discuss this in a civil manner, have our public discussion, and then let the public give us direction. You brought up the word controversy. There's been some controversy and, of course, the subsequent ruling by the state Supreme Court affirming that the legislature will provide titles for constitutional amendments. And uh, you know, the question's been asked about passing new legislation that might require a supermajority in the future to help uh, pass any constitutional amendment legislation. I asked you about this at a news conference, yeah. and you contend that really the majority vote that matters is that of the voters in November. But aside from that, how do you feel about requiring a supermajority? to move any constitutional amendment language out of the legislature. Out of the legislature, mm -hmm. I think it's fine the way it is right now. And the reason I say that is, is it gives the legislature a little wider berth to pass something, to give it to the public. We shouldn't be restricting the public on any question, and I think a supermajority requirement would. Uh, and as I mentioned to you earlier, once it gets to the ballot, it's not just a yes and no count on that particular question, they consider the whole universe total of people voting in the election, and you have to meet the 50% or the simple majority of the entire universe of people. So if you had 20% of the public, let's say they turned out for the presidential election, but 20% said, I don't want to vote at all for, the, for any referendum question, the proponents still have to meet the 50% plus one requirement of the entire population that happened to turn out to the polls. That is a high bar, and this is going to be as equally a high bar to pass this. As voters head to the polls, should, do you think they should do some research on this, or is it pretty straightforward? And, and I think they should. Uh, I think they should talk about it. I think they need to talk about it in their own communities. I think they need to talk about it in their faith communities as well. Uh, get references from it, uh, give it plenty of thought. Uh, the one last position that I know would be definitely uh, affected may be curriculums in public schools, uh, reflecting now the newly recognized relationship and marriage of homosexual couples. Uh, we have health classes, we have sex education programs that are definitely referenced as uh, heterosexual focus in those areas of education. Those could be challenged and it could be forced education of a homosexual brand of health class being taught to our children as well. Okay, Senator Limmer, thank you for your time and for your patience as you and I'm sure our viewers can hear the light rail construction right outside of the window. Oh, Again, bet. we appreciate it. Progress waits for no man. Senator Scott Dibble joins me now to talk about why he believes Minnesotans should vote no for the marriage amendment. Thanks for joining us Thanks, today. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Let's begin, Senator, with 31 states in the United States currently have constitutional amendments that ban legal recognition, recognition of same-sex unions. So in Minnesota, polling on this issue is close. Most indicate the amendment does have the support to pass at this point. So do you believe still that Minnesota will be the first state to defeat this measure. Oh, I absolutely do. And actually, I don't think most polls show that it will pass. One poll shows, uh, it's two that have come from the same source, and that particular poll is shown to be fairly deeply flawed. But every other public poll and every other internal poll that I'm familiar with shows uh, a narrow edge for those who are opposed to the amendment. Um, I think Minnesota will be the first one to defeat an amendment like this for a couple of key reasons. Um, first of all, you know, this is Minnesota and we often are in a position of leading the nation on these issues of really extending freedom and, and embracing diversity and making sure that everyone has the right to enjoy the freedoms that are guaranteed in their constitution. We've been that kind of state for uh, many generations now uh, and something I'm very proud of. It's been uh, you know, just over 18 months since the legislature decided to uh, put this on the ballot and in that time the coalition that has come together to oppose this really crosses all ideological and political and geographic and demographic boundaries. We see a coalition that's over 600 organizations strong. More than 25% of those are represented by communities of faith. Uh, you see Republicans standing up, people from the Independence Party, the Green Party, the Democrats, people from big business, from labor, 
every sector of, of, of Minnesota life, folks standing up saying, we have a common set of values in Minnesota. Marriage is about, fundamentally about commitment and love and responsibility, the ability to protect our families. We have freedoms that are guaranteed in our Constitution. It should not be made illegal to marry the person you love. And in Minnesota, we treat everyone with dignity. And Senator, there seems to be a lot of information and misinformation out there about what this amendment would or would not do. How mm -hmm. would you encapsulate it? Well, basically what it would do is uh, it would be very hurtful and very divisive and it would make it illegal to marry the person you love forever. It would forever take away the ability for subsequent generations to have this debate and this discussion in front of the legislature. Um, and it, would, uh, it, would, it wouldn't uh, create marriage uh, because marriage is currently illegal in our statute books, um, but it would kind of shut down that conversation. We know that uh, people are beginning to understand fundamentally that their values are supported and affirmed uh, when people are able to form strong families and it would prohibit that from happening in the future. And as you just mentioned, it currently is illegal for same-sex marriages in the mm -hmm. state of Minnesota. So if this amendment is indeed defeated, mm -hmm. what impact do you think there would be if the law remains in intact? Well, you know, that remains to be seen. It's hard to predict. That would have a lot to do with the composition of the legislature. Um, but I definitely believe that the tide of public opinion is, is moving in a direction that really supports and affirms all families. Uh, to have some form of legal relationship to each other, um, ideally that's marriage uh, or some, you know, but the ability to further develop other sorts of just, just you know, the basic foundation, the economic platform on which we build our families and, and be able to take that responsibility for each other and protect each other, um, you know, I, I think we'll definitely, s we would see movement in that direction. Senator, this is of course a very personal issue for you. You are involved in a same-sex marriage, so for you, what does this mean and, and how have you been able to absorb the fact that some of the colleagues on your floor feel so, on the Senate floor feel so right. polar opposite as you on right, this issue? Right. Well, I have to admit, Julie, that um, it's been painful um, and been very difficult. You know, we are in the legislature and um, the issues we work on are about the people we represent and the larger state and the legacy that we leave. and. My personal friendships and my personal feelings are, are really secondary. Um, but in this instance, it's hard, you know, and I'm, I'm able typically to work, reach across the aisle and work with a, a colleague from another party on this issue and oppose them strenuously on that issue and that's how the work gets done and it's based on, on our relationships, even though our relationships at the end of the day aren't the things that are going into the history books. It's the statutes and the policies and the priorities that, that and the values that we uphold. But this one's been a little more difficult uh, because fundamentally, at its core, I have colleagues, even colleagues who, who say they support me and Richard and our marriage, who have taken a step, taken a stand to exclude us entirely from our state's constitution, to exclude us entirely from our ability to enjoy the protection and the benefits of the constitution, and they don't get to do that. That's guaranteed to me, that's guaranteed to Richard, because we're citizens of this state. Uh, and so they're saying that somehow or another we're less worthy, we're secondary. It's very hurtful, it's very painful, and it's kind of a metaphor for um, exactly what would happen if this, if this constitutional amendment were to pass. It's very divisive. It's saying, I get to vote on your marriage. Well, who wants their marriage voted on? You know, it, this is not what our state is about. Those who support the amendment essentially states that it would protect the sanctity of marriage. How important is it to you to have that title, that recognition of marriage as opposed to say civil union? Would you be content with civil union? Well, my response to that question is, would you want to trade your marriage for a civil union? And would you want your, your marriage uh, voted on? You know, w in every sense of the word, Richard and I have come together because we fell in love and wanted to build a life together and wanted to invite our friends and family into supporting that. My sister just got married on, sa on Saturday. Um, and it was an amazing and wonderful and affirming celebration. Richard and I got married four years ago. And even though I have the greatest family in the entire world who loves Richard, and they love uh, our, our relationship and they've been so supportive and so affirming, when we had that opportunity to have that, that ceremony, you know, that tradition that, that so many people are familiar with, able to step forward and say, this is who we are and this is who I love, and we invite you to be a part of it. It was transformative to my family. Suddenly they had a vernacular and an understanding 
uh, and access to who we were as a, as a couple in our relationship that just simply wasn't present before. Senator, we are just about out of time, but here's your opportunity to speak to our viewers and why do you think they should vote no? Well, if for no other reason, um, just understanding that voting no affirms and supports the basic values that we all cherish and prize. Love, commitment, family, strong communities, freedom guaranteed in our Constitution, and treating each other with dignity the way I would expect to be treated. Senator Scott Dibble, with those words, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Julie. So, Representative Kiffmeyer, let's begin with the definition of the photo voter ID amendment. The state Supreme Court recently ruled in favor of the language that was recommended by the legislature to be placed on the ballot. Can you kind of encapsulate for us just exactly what voters will be saying either yes or no to? Well, they'll be saying yes or no. And by the way, if you leave it blank, that's the same as a no. That's the rules on voting on constitutional amendments. And so they'll be voting on the very simple process of saying, is a photo ID required as a part of the voting process? And also they will see that a free ID will be provided and that it takes effect July 1st, 2013 for that November election. But the essence of this constitutional amendment is the photo ID requirement. You just mentioned the free ID provided, so I'd like to jump ahead to one of my questions. So if this does pass, how much responsibility do you believe the state does have in ensuring that those who might have a difficult time obtaining this ID, like a college kid or an elder, somebody who's elderly, how much of the onus is on the state to make sure that it's done efficiently and with relative ease? Well, I think, first of all, the state is responsible then to provide that state ID. Okay, And I think uh, no matter young, old, no matter whatever that kind of situation it is, uh, to work with them. But you have 134 state reps, 67 senators, you have the governor's office, secretary of state's office, and in other states, the secretary of state's office is very engaged with AARP, Lutheran, Catholic, atheist, I mean, you name it, everybody, as far as getting the word out and doing voter education uh, to make sure that everybody knows, first of all, that they need to have one. Uh, we currently have a list that the Secretary of State Office has matched with the Department of Public Safety. So they have a list of people who are registered to vote but do not yet have an ID. The good news is we know their name, we know their address, we can mail them and work with them and contact them to make sure that they know. So there is so much that can be done to reach out to everybody and in the typical Minnesota way, using all of our connections and all of our groups uh, to be able to reach out to them. Two justices, as I mentioned earlier in this interview, um, the Supreme Court ruled on the language. Now, two justices dissented from that decision, and Justice Alan Page wrote in his dissent, I would conclude that the ballot question on the voting amendment proposed by the legislature is materially and fundamentally deceptive and misleading. Now, it's fair to say that you're going to disagree with this assessment. Yes, I but do it, disagree. So it, it does beg the question, though, why not put the language from the legislation directly on the ballot? Well, you know, the thing is you have precedent in the uh, legislative processes. And so in all its years since Minnesota has done constitutional amendments and in all the recent history, the process has been that you put a title on, you do the ballot question, and you don't put the complete actual amendment changes on the actual ballot itself. That's not done. And so as a legislator, uh, I would maybe agree that it would be good. I think it's just as Paul Anderson said, put it all on. I would agree. But that is not what the precedent was or the custom was. And so I followed that. And so the last two constitutional amendments uh, back in the early 2000s uh, were done in the same way. And that's why. Okay. And also, as we we're talking a little bit about some criticisms, critics also argue that if passed, this would disenfranchise certain segments of the population. Again, safe to say that you would um, disagree with that. I would disagree with that. As a matter of fact, it will actually enfranchise them. It will actually make them more included. How so? 
Well, because when you're reaching out to give somebody a free state ID, that means you're giving them a free state ID, not only for voting purposes, but to open up a bank account, to, to do other things that are so common and so necessary that you have that ID. It, when they don't have that, it makes them vulnerable and dependent. And Andrew Young, former African-American mayor of Atlanta, Georgia, and then later an ambassador under, I believe, President Bill Clinton, supports photo ID. Uh, in part for that reason. It enables them to stand alone in the voting process, to have the dignity that goes with that. Plus, it's a valuable tool to be used in other facets of our society. And so I think it's an inclusive and franchising tool. And the big thing is to work with them and get out the word. Many of them, though, are on welfare benefits. So we can use that channel to communicate with them. Did you know you're going to be able to get a free state ID and help them to do that? This is so can do and is an, is an inclusive and an enfranchising process rather than a disenfranchising. And in other states that have implemented photo ID, not one single case of disenfranchisement, not one in any of those states. So ultimately, what's the intention of of this piece of legislation, of this amendment? Increasing public confidence, which thereby will increase voter participation. Because if you don't have confidence, you don't participate. And so that focus is really, really important. And I think that's why the public supports photo ID so much, because they stand in line to vote. They have those questions and concerns. They go through everything else in life where they're required to show an ID. The most valuable public thing you can have is a ballot. Spends uh, People are elected from it who spend trillions of dollars. And so in the public realm, who you vote for is a secret. Who you are and where you live is not. It's a public list. It's a voter registration list. And so I think for all of us in realizing that the reason why there's a great public support for that is they have those questions. It'll increase public confidence. Representative Mary Kiffmeyer, thanks for coming in and advocating for the voter photo ID. We certainly appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. We continue our discussion on the voter photo ID constitutional amendment with a member who opposes that amendment. Senator Katie Sieben joins me now to talk a little bit about why you think that Minnesotans should vote no on this. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. You bet. So, Senator, let's begin with, you know, you've made some compelling arguments in committee last session on why you oppose voter photo ID. So explain why you think Minnesotans should just say no. I think the main issue is that there's too much ambiguity in the proposed constitutional amendment. We're not sure exactly what the implications will be. For instance, will students be able to use a photo ID from their college along with a electric bill, for instance, that has their address on it to um, prove their residency to be able to vote? We don't know. The constitutional amendment, um, if it passes, will um, be set up for the legislature to determine, to determine whether or not um, that issue, whether students can vote using their college IDs as they can now, um, will still be in effect. Um, another example is, will um, senior citizens in nursing homes be able to um, use some of the same procedures now to be able to vote um, if the photo ID amendment passes. It's very unlikely they won't. For instance, right now, um, many senior homes, um, the, uh, the caretakers can vouch for residents of a nursing home. That will no longer be able to occur. So there's just a lot of potential that the amendment, if it passes, will um, will not allow Minnesotans who have the right to vote to be able to vote. Let's talk a little bit about the language that will be on the ballot. The state Supreme Court recently ruled that that language and the title of voter ID can be provided by the legislature. Now, Justice Alan Page wrote in his dissent that I would conclude that the ballot question on the voting amendment proposed by the legislature is materially and fundamentally deceptive and misleading. Would you agree with this? I would agree with that. If you look at the actual question that's put before voters, it's substantially different, or it's different, I should say, than the um, enacting language that, if it's passed, will be written into the Constitution. So one big problem with it is that it says that um, 
no one's sure what substantially equivalent um, voting uh, mechanisms will, what that actually means. So there's ambiguity between the question before um, voters and the actual language that will be instituted. And so do you think then, would you support a measure that states the language that the legislature passes needs to be the language on the ballot, that they need to be one and the same? The problem is is that with election law, um, and this is, I think, to the heart of the issue of why this should not be going in the state constitution, this is something we could do legislatively. The legislature should work and could work in a bipartisan way to pass election reform that will um, take care of some of the problems that have been raised in recent years. Um, we have a proven track record of doing that back a couple years ago. Um, the legislature should do that, pass it um, legislatively, legislatively and have Governor Dayton sign it so that we're not putting things into the Constitution or language into our state constitution that could be, um, that will be uh, not relevant in decades to come perhaps. An argument that's been made consistently throughout this debate has been that voter photo ID disenfranchises certain segments of the population. This argument was actually countered on our program last week by Representative Mary Kiffmeyer. She stated that by offering free IDs to those who typically couldn't afford or have access to one, we're actually enfranchising those segments of the population. Would you agree with this? No, I mean, that doesn't make sense because, for instance, there was in the Star Tribune this weekend, there was an article about a woman who was born in Mississippi on a farm and all she has is f after trying to track down a birth certificate, I think to go on a cruise or something, um, all she could get was her cert was a some type of certificate of birth that showed she was born along with her brothers and sisters and the date. There's no she can't get. There is no birth certificate that she has. So um, under the proposed constitutional amendment, this woman who has been voting for decades has the right to vote in Minnesota. Everyone who knows or acknowledges that um, she's a citizen, she's a resident of Minnesota and meets all the requirements, she wouldn't be able to get a photo, a photo ID um, and therefore would be disenfranchised. Is this, does this seem like an overwhelming task, in your opinion, to try to get IDs to everybody? I think one point, one final point that I want to make is that when I touched on earlier that we did see some um, voting problems in Minnesota, primarily what they were, if the um, viewers recall, was it was a case of felons who erroneously voted or um, who should not have voted. Photo ID won't solve that because when you show your ID, it doesn't say on your driver's license whether or not you're a felon. So I'm not a felon, but if I was, um, I could still show my ID and and vote, um, you know, if I wasn't supposed to, because the photo ID won't stop the felon from voting. So there are things that we should do as a legislature. It's incumbent on us as legislators to work on solutions in a bipartisan way to address the real issues at hand. Photo ID doesn't solve those those real problems. Okay, Senator Katie Stephen, we are out of time. Thank you for your perspective on the issue. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. And that wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Bartke. Thank you for watching.